good af afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to shift gear. I'm going to be a little bit more uh, uh, technical, but not too uh, technical. So, uh, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Right? Uh, I'll, I'll try to estimate. <laughs> no, no, not really. But uh, the term nanotechnology uh, derives its name from the Greek word nanos. Nanos means dwarf. Actually, for those of you who speak Hebrew, the word nanas in Hebrew originates also in the same uh, Greek uh, uh, word. But in the scientific uh, context, nanotechnology is linked to a length scale, one nanometer. One nanometer is one billionth of a meter or one millionth of a millimeter. So how small it is? It's a very, very tiny length scale. Turns out to be a very fundamental length scale of nature, as I'm going to mention uh, later. And usually, it's very difficult for, for people who are not actually working in, in, in nanotechnology or in chemistry to have a feeling for the smallness of one uh, nanometer. So I'm going to illustrate how small one nanometer is in two ways. First of all, let me tell you that a sphere, which is one nanometer in diameter, relates to an orange the same way an orange relates to planet Earth. So if you want to have a feeling for how many uh, spheres of a diameter one, one nanometer would fit into one orange, you may try to imagine how many oranges can fit into a vessel of the size of Earth. So you can close your eyes and try to imagine that, and I'm sure that you're going to imagine many, many oranges. So this is, <laughs> right, this, this is as much uh, uh, nanometers that go into an orange. But then there is a, another uh, illustration, a little bit more technical, but very educating. And uh, that, that has to, to do with the volume required to store information. So as you know, uh, information these days, and Adolfo was mentioning it, most of the information is in fact stored digitally. And it is stored in bits, in just one and zero. And with these ones and zeros, one can uh, encode everything, basically. So I'm going to illustrate how small a one nanometer is by uh, trying to estimate how much would it take to store the full library of Congress, uh, everything which is probably the largest uh, collection of or l largest documentation of uh, humankind, uh, culture, and uh, uh, heritage. So Im to that end, you may imagine, suppose you know uh, a, a group of astronauts embarks on a decades-long uh, journey to outer space, and you would like to equip them with a copy of all human history as, for instance, uh, uh, documented in the Library of Congress. So in terms of those bits, uh, everything, paintings, text, science, architecture, videos, films, music, everything you may think about, which is included in the uh, Library of Congress, occupies about 10 to the 16 bits of information, so it would be one, and then 16 zeros. This is how many those of these tiny bits you would uh, need in order to store this collection of human uh, culture. And now imagine for, the minute, for a minute that you could have stored this information at a density of one bit of information occupying one cubic nanometer. Right, I still have to prove to you that this is possible, but for the, for the time being, just bear with me. Imagine that you could have stored information in this density. One cubic nanometer occupying one bit of information. And then you may ask yourself the following question. 
well, how big should the box those astronauts take with them be so that it really stores everything that mankind ever created? Will, will they need to take a city, a tower, a, a, a room in, uh, in your house, a shoebox, matchbox? How, how small uh, or how large would it be? So the, the answer is actually astonishing. I don't know whether any of you has a feeling or has a guess for that, but let me tell you the answer. Uh, the answer is that you, need, you can store everything that mankind ever created in a box which is about uh, one-fifth of a millimeter by one-fifth of a millimeter by one-fifth of a millimeter, which is more or less two hair fibers by two hair fibers by two hair fibers. So those astronauts are not going to take a huge load with them, and th their concern is probably going to be not losing it. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't like to use it. When you go to, uh, on a journey, a decades-long journey to outer space, you wouldn't like to lose this uh, uh, um, copy of human uh, uh, culture because you will spend the rest of the journey just looking for it. I mean, it's <laughs> but that gives you another feeling for how small one nanometer is. And now, of course, the, 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 the question is uh, whether this is uh, possible or is it just uh, imagination? And the answer is actually uh, given to us by nature. As you know, uh, the genetic code of all organisms, quite universally, is encoded in long DNA molecules. And uh, in each cell of your body, you have a full copy of this uh, 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 genome. By the way, in terms of information, this genome is uh, very disappointing. It's very, very small. Much smaller than your hard disk uh, at home. So, but anyway, the genetic information is encoded there. And the way it is encoded there is that uh, DNA is, comprises four different uh, bases. So those are the building blocks, A, C, T, and G. And they are just changed in sequence. And this sequence is just a digital encoding of uh, our genetic uh, information. Remarkably, each of those building blocks, they're called um, nucleic acids, each of those nucleic acids is made more or less of 100 atoms, and its volume is about one cubic nanometer. So new nature actually stores information, uh, copies information, generates proteins or produces proteins based on that information, manipulate that information exactly at this scale. One cubic nanometer per bit of information. And this is, of course, uh, uh, a proof that this is, uh, th this is possible. So nature, at least, can uh, uh, do that. And to answer that, that question that I was asking before, how large would it take to, to store the whole Library of Congress in these dimensions, you now see that all you need is about uh, a box full of DNA, which is about one-fifth of a millimeter on the side. And that, I think, gives you another feeling for how small a uh, 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 nanometer uh, uh, is. Um, so as, as Richard Feynman, the forefather of nanotechnology, uh, said in uh, his seminal 95, 19, 1955 uh, lecture before the American Physical Society, there is indeed plenty of room at, at the bottom. There are vast spaces. If you can operate on this fundamental one nanometer scale, there is vast space. There is a whole world down there, which is, of course, com we are completely blind to it. None of our senses can sense it, but it's a huge world uh, down there. So why did we write the Nano Bible? I mean, this is a question that Many people, of course, uh, uh, ask uh, ourselves. Uh, so let me tell you that, in fact, uh, we conceived it as part of uh, an education uh, program we were running with high school students 
And it turned out that it was very difficult to demonstrate to those students uh, how small one nanometer is and how small one can make things uh, using nanotechnology. So this is uh, how, how it uh, started. Um, and, and we were hoping to encourage those students to imagine the vast potential uh, of being able to manipulate matter at these tiny, very fundamental uh, building blocks, same size uh, of building blocks used by uh, uh, nature. Um, we also wanted, of course, to spark their imagination about this new era. Nanotechnology is really a new era. Uh, many of you probably don't uh, appreciate that, or, but many of the devices you, you're using on a daily basis, uh, much of the uh, uh, new treatments in medicine, new materials, much denser electronics, uh, ecology, energy, are already deeply affected by nanotechnology, and our intention was really to inspire those uh, high school kids to think about this, this world, which is, of course, we are completely blind to it uh, with our uh, uh, senses. And then, uh, but why have we chosen script, and why did we choose the Hebrew Bible? That's another uh, uh, question which we are being asked uh, very frequently. So, script is undoubtedly, uh, has a, an undoubtedly unique role in human culture. Uh, it expresses mankind's ideas and dreams in their pure, purest form. At least, this is the way we uh, felt. And, you know, the process by which a, a written word incarnates in a form of idea, abstract idea, I find it really mystical almost. I mean, you have some printed text, you read it, and it turns into an abstract idea, uh, just, you know, translating this uh, black, uh, black uh, ink. So script is really very, very special in uh, mankind uh, um, history. Uh, and that, that, of course, reminds life itself in a sense, because this DNA that uh, I, I mentioned to you, in, in a sense, this is also the purest way of storing uh, life, in a sense. Of course, life is far, far more than that. So this comparison actually suggests that text, in a sense, is the DNA of mankind culture. I, 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 at least, I can't think of a purest uh, way or something closer to DNA, or analogous to DNA in terms of uh, human, human uh, uh, culture. Uh, it is, uh, um, I mean, so script uh, really embodies this DNA of uh, uh, society. Now it's very interesting, something that I learned actually in my last presentation here, that in Kabbalah, letters are considered the building blocks of the universe. That's a very, very interesting uh, uh, statement. And according to the Kabbalah, in the Kabbalah it says that uh, God gave letters to men so that they can create. Again, uh, this, uh, this uh, relation between uh, characters and DNA, for uh, uh, instance. And the last point I wanted to mention is the imprinting technology, which Adolfo already uh, mentioned. Uh, we, were, we, we were trying, it was important for us to correspond with the ancient way of writing. And one of the ancient ways of, of uh, writing is, of course, engraving in stone. So we chose to engrave in the closest form of, uh, or closest modern form of uh, stone, which is a silicon crystal. Silicon is made out of sand, if you like, and in our case, uh, coated uh, with, uh, coated with uh, gold. Of course, rather than using uh, a chisel and a hammer, we've used uh, the modern chisel uh, and a hammer, which is a focused uh, beam of ions, gallium uh, ions. Uh, but the, the, uh, the principle 
is the same. We were just engraving using those ions, and you will see it in the movie. We were just engraving text in uh, stone, except we can engrave approximately uh, one million copies of the Bible, of the full Bible. We can engrave those million uh, copies in more or less one letter, which was engraved in stone in ancient, uh, ancient times. So our technology has made some progress uh, in the last uh, 2,000 uh, uh, years. So uh, just uh, before uh, uh, finishing, I would like to take this uh, uh, opportunity and recognize the tremendous contribution by so many people that made it all uh, possible. First and most, I would like to recognize the contribution of Dr. Ohad Zohar, my friend and former student, who created the first Nano Bible in 2007. By the way, uh, a second copy of the Bible was given as, a pres as the present of the State of Israel to the uh, Pope in his uh, visit to the Holy Land in 2009. And so President Perez asked us to prepare a, a copy, which, is, which was very, uh, actually a very funny story because we worked very hard to produce this Bible. And then uh, some reporter asked us, why do you work so hard anyway? Nobody can see it. I mean, why don't you just g give away this half millimeter uh, dice and, and that's it? So uh, then somebody else said, but you know, uh, could be that in 500 years, people would be able to, to read it with bare eye or something like that, and we'll see that it's completely empty. And then uh, somebody else said, yes, but what do you care? I mean, you're not going to be here in 500 <laughs> years. And then I said, well, I'm probably not going to be here, but President Perez may. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyway, so I wanted to thank uh, Ohad uh, uh, Zohar and Yvette Gershon, who actually followed this project in the whole process since uh, 2007. The exhibition, as you learned, was conceived by Dr. Uh, Adolfo Reutmann, who is the curator of the Shrine of the Book, and uh, the head of the Shrine of the Book, curator of this uh, uh, exhibition, and Rotem Marielli. Uh, co-curator of the exhibition. Alina Hamo is the architect and designer of this wonderful uh, exhibition. I'm sure you will uh, appreciate that. And then uh, there is a, a whole uh, group of uh, scientists and engineers uh, headed by Professor Nir Tesler, the head of the Zisapel Nanoelectronics uh, Center. Um, uh, those uh, engineers include uh, Jakob Schneider, C.P. Cohen, Orna Terniak, Svetlana Yossis, all working at the Russell Berry Nanotechnology Institute, the Zisapel Nanoelectronics in, uh, Center, and the Volson Microelectronics Center at Technion, and I'm sure that some of you or many of you have already uh, visited there. I would like to thank our Division of Public uh, uh, Affairs. And, uh, Again, it was already mentioned here, but I, I would really like to express our gratitude from the bottom of our hearts to Mrs. Angelica Berry and the Russell Berry Foundation. I mean, without them, nothing of that could have materialized. And also to John and uh, Arnold uh, Seidel and family who are sitting here. And, uh, <laughs> for their generous donation uh, that uh, made it uh, all uh, possible. And last but not least, of course, the museum director, Mr. James Snyder, and Technion president, and his, uh, his VPs uh, here, uh, Gadi Schuster, Boaz Golani, and Wayne Kaplan. So thank you very much. And, okay.